Well, we are on week five of a six-week series on Holy Spirit. And um, last week, we looked at Holy Spirit and injustice and social action. And uh, for these last two weeks, we're moving into what may be to some a bit more traditional territory and thinking about how we think about Holy Spirit. But at the same time, I may well bring up some things and some different thoughts um, that maybe you've had before and hopefully remind you of some familiar ones as well that might be a blessing to you as well. Um, <clears throat> sorry. So, sorry, there we are. And so, yeah, so this week we're looking at two nice light subjects in roughly 30 minutes, um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the prophetic. And next week, we're looking at the gifts of the Spirit and, reality, and the realities of church life. And uh, yeah, I'm going to be very down to earth and practical about a lot of things next week within what we look at, which um, I'm hoping will be helpful to everyone. Um, one of the things that you'll see is that there is a common theme of unity that is going to grow over the next two weeks because the irony and some of you might wonder why have subjects around the holy spirit in the church tended to be so contentious there's been splits over churches over things like gifts of the spirit and the subjects of tongues and what does the baptism of the spirit mean and how the gift of prophecy and the prophetic is used and the irony of that is that in Ephesians 4 3 Paul makes it very clear he says make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace isn't it interesting that Paul is saying that the priority of the work of the spirit is unity and peace we see earlier in Romans 5.5, 5, as I mentioned in the very first week, the Holy Spirit, the love of God is poured into our hearts by Holy Spirit. So these are the things that we need to remember <clears throat> when we look at these subjects is that there is a theme of unity. And Paul goes on to say something in Ephesians 4 that is really significant in verse 3 because he says, talks about unity in the spirit and then says, until we all reach unity in the faith, and become mature. What is your definition of what it means to be a mature Christian? Is it someone who goes to church every week? Is it someone who goes to church every week and has a quiet time and reads their Bible during the week? I'm not saying those things don't foster maturity, they do. But at the same time, where are we in this whole area of unity? Because I want to suggest to you that maturity equals unity. If we don't have a heart and passion for unity in the body of Christ, we are not really maturing in our relationship with God. To me, that's what this is suggesting. So, a nice light introductory thought. We're going to pray. I want to recommend to you this fantastic book. I've never seen anything like it. It is a book of prayers to Holy Spirit. It's by Jack Levinson, who I've mentioned before. It's called Holy Spirit, I Pray. And I'm going to read a prayer from this as a way of opening our prayer um, time. And if I can open the page. So <clears throat> please look to the Lord. I'm going to pray this and then just read this scripture underneath. And we're going to go from there. Holy Spirit, fiery ecstasy, language maker. Don't let me come unsuspecting to Pentecost or arrive ill-equipped at ecstasy. Sharpen my will to study, hone my mind to think, whet my appetite to learn. And when I part my lips, breathe out words, God's praiseworthy acts, let them come first. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And John the Baptist is speaking in Matthew 3 and says, He's 
will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, I want you to think for a second, because does that suggest that John had a little, maybe a little inkling in his mind that he might have known something about what was going to happen three years later? When the Holy Spirit falls on those people waiting in an upper room, and it says that tongues of fire came and touched them. Acts 1.8, which is one of my favorite verses, says, when he's, you will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will go down the street, a bit further away and very far away. <clears throat> you see, this is the promise of the prophet Joel. This is the promise as I spoke about last week of all flesh, the promise of the spirit being poured out on everyone. And we have this beautiful story of Peter, the fearful doubter who <clears throat> comes and preaches to thousands of people and thousands of people get baptized. Do you think Peter maybe had to let go of some control for that to happen? One of the things that we have to think about in terms of what it means to receive the blessing of the spirit and that joy that comes in the morning is maybe we're holding on to too many things and not letting go to allow the spirit to come. Sometimes that can be an issue in that. So they waited together in a room, men and women. Maybe they waited in silence. Maybe they cried out. We don't really know. But what we do know, as I've mentioned before, that the patience and importance of waiting is a part of this story. And the Holy Spirit comes on all of them, it says. And there were tongues of fire that came and they begin to speak words that they don't understand themselves, but are understood by the people around them. And these words are praises of God. What we have here on the day of Pentecost is worship evangelism. They're declaring the praises of God. Wonderful. And the thing I want us to notice in part of this is that when you look at the day of Pentecost, it was a beginning. People from the day of Pentecost went on to plant churches in other parts of the world. Some of them stayed in Jerusalem. What we do know is that this was a primarily Jewish audience. It was a primarily a primary experience of those who were Jewish. And Peter goes on to be on a trip somewhere where the Holy Spirit shows up and speaks to him about the Gentiles and, and things not being unclean. And he says to Peter in Acts 10, Verse 20, arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. <clears throat> and then he goes and meets this guy called Cornelius, and it tells us in verse 44 that what happened on the day of Pentecost then happens to Cornelius' house and the Peter and his friends, it, exactly the same thing happens. Jack Levinson interprets that word doubting nothing as he goes, God's saying to Peter, go without discrimination. <clears throat> You see, there was a factor for Peter, and there was a factor even, and which I suggest is a factor for all of us. If we have issues with discrimination, then that is going to have issues in terms of our ability to both listen to, receive, and respond to the Holy Spirit. Go without discrimination, he says. And Peter does that, and he shows up with a bit of trepidation <laughs> at Cornelius' house. And Peter's not even part way through what he's doing in his teaching and the Holy Spirit comes upon them and the same thing happens with the tongues of fire to those people. It's wonderful. So as you can see here, we have two Pentecosts. <clears throat> now what we see from that is after that, we see people praying for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
And in the book of Acts, we have five examples of that. Two of them are the two Pentecost, and then we have three other examples. There's other examples in the, in the epistles as well. And what this tells us is that there was a filling of the Holy Spirit that people experienced after Pentecost that wasn't identical to Pentecost. There was a way in which people were filled with the Spirit, and it only actually clearly mentions tongues in two of these five examples. It talks about being filled with the Spirit for in terms of other things. So Acts 4.31, after this prayer meeting, the meeting place shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they preached the word of God with boldness. <clears throat> Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers and they received the Holy Spirit. Ananias with Saul, by the way, just think for a minute about Ananias as one of the great heroes of the Bible. Talk about a gutsy guy. I haven't got time to go into that more, but take a look in Acts chapter 9. The guy is amazing. And he says, he sent me that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, you've got the... Um, the second Pentecost as well. So, so you have these examples here. Okay, now there are people that say different things, and obviously I'm offering my thoughts on this tonight, and not everyone may necessarily agree. <laughs> that means we're meant to love each other, listen to each other, and journey with one another in the spirit. But what we seem to clearly see here is that the apostles prayed for new believers to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, but what does that mean? Does that mean that they actually weren't believers? It says believers. So they were already in a place where in some way they'd received Christ. And I want to suggest to you that Romans 8 and 9 is an especially important verse when it comes to thinking about this subject, it says this, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed God's spirit dwells in you, now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. There is a way that we as Christians have the Holy Spirit. And I even want to suggest to you that Holy Spirit, it's, you know, it talks about Holy Spirit being a rushing wind, going wherever, wherever Holy Spirit wants to go. So Holy Spirit could be filling and touching people that may not necessarily definitively know God. You know, God is bigger than our cozy little Christian world sometimes. And we need to recognize in, in, in that reality. Holy Spirit is not restricted by you know, some of the things that we're necessarily thinking about. But in the context of this subject of being filled with the Spirit, or some people say baptized in the Spirit, then what does it mean if to be filled with the Spirit, if we already have the Spirit when we know Christ? Because God wants to fill us with Holy Spirit in a way where there's a greater empowerment and a greater fruit in our life. And I want to suggest to you, and I've written it here and you can see it, that the baptism of the Spirit or the filling of the Spirit that we see here is like a kickstart in our communion and empowerment with Holy Spirit. We then go on in, need, in the need of being continually filled. Ephesians 5.18 says, be and the language there, it doesn't say it here, but it, this is what it means. It says, be continually filled with the Spirit. We are meant to be filled with the Spirit. We are meant to go out filled with the Spirit. We leak, we empty out. We need to be filled again. We need to be continually filled. But all of us need, I suggest to you, an initial first experience of that special presence of God from which we then cry out for the continuing ongoing empowerment of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The way that happened to me 
was that I was um, I became a Christian, as I mentioned before, in Canada in a hotel room by myself while I was touring with a band. And um, a few weeks later, I found myself playing in a blues bar um, in Whitehorse in the Yukon. We were flown up to the Yukon to this place and were playing with this band. And while I was there, there was a man who came up to me randomly and looked at me and said, you're a new Christian, aren't you? <clears throat> <laughs> so I said, yes, I am. And he said, um, well, I wonder if you would be interested in doing a Bible study about baptism. And I visited his church on Sunday and, um, and it was a lot of fun. And um, we did this Bible study for the short time that I was there playing in this bar. And the, almost what, within the day, a couple of days before I left, I got baptized. And when I got baptized, I came out of the water and the Holy Spirit fell on me. And I just had this drenching, glorious experience of the presence and power of God. Now, the funny thing was, is that I actually had to go and do a gig that night right afterwards. So some of the lovely women that have put all this food together to celebrate the baptism, me, me being Mr. Sensitive, was like, uh, I'm sorry, but I've got to go back and play in the bar right now, you know, to these lovely, beautiful, holy Pentecostal ladies. And um, they were like, who on earth are we baptized here, right? Well, I'm walking along after the gig back to a house where I was staying and the Holy Spirit fell on me again. And I was actually kind of almost looking kind of drunk like that story in the book of Acts. And people came up to me and what's wrong with you? You're walking around all funny, you drunk or something. And I said, no, this is the Holy Spirit. And I told him about Jesus. By the way, I do think it's hilarious that when the people go to Peter and say, are you drunk? He doesn't moralistically say, oh, no, we don't drink or anything. He says, no, you're joking. It's finally five and nine o'clock in the morning. I think, sorry, a bit of humor in this. I think that's a really funny part of this story. But, you know, so, um, so yeah, and so that was my initial experience. I got back to my home church in Essex after the tour with the band. And my friends started talking to me about being filled with the Spirit and the baptism. This thing called tongues that I had never heard of before. I did not go in. I've grown up in a Christian family, by the way. I grew up, I knew nothing. <clears throat> and, but by the way, I did, um, was given a Bible by someone and I actually read through the entire Bible in my first six weeks as a Christian. So I was coming downstairs to the band and I read this brilliant book last night. It's called Job and things like that. And, uh, but in Essex, people gave me these books on tongues and being filled with the spirit. And I thought, okay, well, I want whatever God wants. I didn't know anything any better. And I asked for this tongues thing. And one night I was going into a 1662 service by myself. I was handed the, uh, the bucket load of books as I went in and sat down with all my books. I was still fairly clueless about liturgy and things like that. And I sat down and, uh, and I was just praying for the vicar and praying for the service. And I found words coming out of my mouth were words that I didn't know. And that was an experience for me. My first experience of this whole speaking in tongues thing was actually in a 1662 service on a Sunday night by myself. And I want to say a word about tongues because this kind of tongues, which people call like a, some people call a personal prayer language or something like that, I have to say for myself, has been a big blessing. And it's something that has helped me at times. It's not something I do a ton, but I do find it's helpful. When I think about this in terms of Paul, I think it's really funny that Paul says two things. He says, I pray in tongues more than all of you. But then he also says that I carry the burden of the churches. I find myself praying in tongues the most, usually when I'm in trouble. <laughs> or something's going on where I just completely don't know how to handle it. Sounds like Paul may have had a bit of a similar experience, I wonder. And we haven't got time to look at prayer in any detail when it comes to Holy Spirit. But in Romans 8, it talks about the Holy Spirit giving, helping us to pray. 
with groanings that cannot be uttered. Sometimes some people think that means tongues. I personally don't think that. I actually think that it's talking about the heart of God within us um, coming out um, more so than tongues. But um, there are some people that think that. But clearly, Holy Spirit helps us to pray. And we can see that very clearly. This tongues thing is not about being any better, worse or than anyone else when it comes to spirituality. I have friends that are 100 times more godly than I am that do not speak in tongues, and I wonder if they really need to. Is it that big of a thing? We make so much out of this, and some people do, and some people don't, and you know, and I think that, you know, maybe we can just look at it that that's how it is. If it's something that you're really wanting, then have people pray for you, come alongside. I've prayed for people over the years and things like that. And that's something that if you do want that as a blessing, then certainly, you know, very happy to pray for you in that. And I know others, certainly at St. Stephen's, others would, uh, and others would probably do that too, I would think. So, um, <clears throat> so. I just wanted to say some very practical things about that because, pardon the pun, but there are many interpretations on this issue. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting that only two of the examples that I gave are about tongues in the book of Acts. There are times when people want to this, but it doesn't happen. Why? I don't, I, my answer to that is simple. I really don't know. And the gift of tongues, when we think of the gifts of the spirit, I'm going to talk about next week. Okay, so hold on to that. I just wanted to mention some of the personal stuff today, but we'll come back and we are going to look at the, when we get in the gifts of the spirit, we're going to get into this a little bit more next week as well. Holy Spirit is mentioned in the book of Acts 59 times. Six times it says the Holy Spirit spoke to them and <clears throat> we'll be sending you the powerpoint so you'll get this but also you can see this and keep it on the youtube you might even want to take a little picture the list of the scriptures you can see there where it says the holy spirit spoke this confirms again the holy spirit as person the person of the holy spirit like you remember in week one when we prayed the grace together the fellowship of the holy spirit and we have this beautiful promise that Jesus mentions in the Gospel of Luke. How much more will your Father in heaven give the give Holy Spirit to those who ask him? <laughs> Isn't that great? <clears throat> so I want to encourage us in this. So if you want to be, if you want prayer to be filled with the Holy Spirit, stick around after and we will have to do some prayer even here. And I'm going to pray a very specific prayer to be filled with the Spirit when we get to the end of this session as well. So we can do a little bit of prayer. And if there's more we need to do, we can talk about how we can do that and what that would look like. Okay. Um, all right, so hopefully that answers some things and thoughts about what it means to be filled with the Spirit. <clears throat> now we're going to look at the prophetic. First of all, what it isn't. First of all, it has little to do with telling the future. It doesn't mean it doesn't. Notice I said little to do. There can be a futuristic element to prophecy that I would suggest you does still exist today. But I think that it is given way too much press and way too much attention compared to what Paul describes in terms of the overall gift. Secondly, anything of a prophetic nature is not going to contradict the written word of God. Now, that can be complicated because there's obviously a subjective views in terms of what is the word of God. But I think in a pure practical terms, we're going to know in an I mean this more in the obvious kinds of ways in terms of morally and legally and what have you. And lastly, if somebody shares like a personal prophetic word over you, it will really be something that isn't confirmation to something that you've been thinking about already. 
you know, and the way to handle that is to thank the person for the word they've shared with you and then go away and pray about it. And if it's something that resonates, have some other people pray about it with you so that you can get more of a confirmation that way, make it a community thing. And then you got, you can either embrace certain things from it or all of it or throw it out if it's not from God, you know, um, and that's the way kind of to, to handle those kinds of things, I would suggest. And, uh, and we need to, if we are doing this kind of a ministry where we're sharing words with people, it's a heavy, heavy thing to do. It's a heavy responsibility and it's not something that in any way should be treated lightly. The prophetic is something that has caused a huge amount of damage in the church. I call it the worst used and most abused gift in the body of Christ. There are whole denominations that won't touch the prophetic right now because of bad experiences. You know, people have had cultures of a resident prophet. People give themselves the office of prophet. You've got people giving people words as a way of manipulating people to do things in churches and organizations. And sadly, I've seen all of that. And um, much of the time it is something I, a lot of times I would suggest it's seen something that can be spiritually abusive. And sometimes, let me come back to that. What it is, I like to describe the prophetic in four ways. First of all, messianic we have messianic prophecy in the bible those are the things in the bible that talk specifically about jesus that we see in the old testament and are re, some are re-mentioned again in the new testament then you've got biblical prophecy which is what i call the stuff about the end times the things that you see in like the book of daniel and the book of revelation and uh, <clears throat> again wish i could say more about that because i think there's a lot of misunderstanding about that too but maybe another time then you've got the personal prophecy. That's that giving words thing I was talking about a minute ago. And then you have society, what I would describe as societal prophecy. This is the prophetic voice where somebody has a voice that influences a generation. You have certain Christians that have had a, a, a wider influence on issues related to society. And, of course, the most famous recent one of that, of course, would be Martin Luther King. But you've got other people, I would suggest, that could fall into that category, like maybe Jim Wallace or Brian McLaren or Francis Schaeffer, Dag Hammarskjöld, who was the former head of the UN, who was a fascinating guy that I've always been interested in. And I would suggest to somewhat, and this might be a bit controversial because he's still around, but I worked with Oasis Trust for a number of years, and I would uh, put Steve Chalk in this category as well for some of the things that he's done over the years as well. And not everybody would necessarily agree with me on that, but I personally think that he's done some things to really influence various areas in his role with anti-trafficking and his role in education. So I'm throwing that, I'm having the guts to throw that one out there, but uh, I, I, so I would I would put him in that category too. So you've got those four things there, and um, so yeah. So now I want to go back for a moment from what I just said there about how the thing about this personal prof prophecy is that we live to hear God's voice for ourselves. We get our own guidance because we're the ones that have got to live with it. And Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. So we need to listen to God. We need to learn how to hear the voice of God. And again, that's another subject that I think would be great to do a whole thing on like this, because again, we really talk about it. We say we're in a personal relationship with God, but then what does it mean to hear the Lord's voice? So. I've seen, sadly, in the past, people actually live on prophecy. You know, oh, I got this word, so I went there. I got this word, so I did this. Please don't do that. You live out of your own personal intimacy with God, and these prophetic things come alongside, and they're meant to help. They're meant to encourage. They're meant to be a blessing. They're not to be something that you take literally as a word every single time for the direction you take with your life. I've seen some very sad consequences from that over the years. 
Now, in 1 Corinthians 14, we're told to seek this gift. The, the actual word for this is the word covet. It's the same that has the negative side of it when it comes to the Ten Commandments. You know, do not covet your neighbor's goods. We are to covet for the gift of prophecy. That's what that word means. We're to really, really want this. And then Paul goes on to make it really simple. He says, basically, all this is about is strengthening, encouragement, and comfort in verse 3. So maybe you can all think about something you've done today where you've strengthened someone or you've encouraged someone or you've provided comfort for someone. Guess what? You have prophesied. That's the biblical definition of the gift of prophecy. Yet that's why this, the, that is the key. That's what we need to grab a hold of. It's not to dismiss the foretelling element, but it's to bring balance to the foretelling element. This is the only place where God says it's okay to covet something, to earnestly desire. Now, sometimes this can also come as something that contains warning and judgment. Do I think that there can still be judgment today from God? Yeah, because it's part of his nature and character, and it's also an aspect of God's love. Judgment is tied into justice. But there can be warnings. And sometimes warnings can come. And this is why the Holy Spirit is the wind I was talking about earlier. I remember I was working in a, um, with a homeless organization in Canada. And a man walked in who had a bit too much to drink and looked at me and my friend and said, this place is going to be closed within three months. And actually named the name of some leaders in the organization I was working with. And I was like, "Wow, how does this guy even know all this? So I completely dismissed it. He said, oh, this guy's just off his, you know, whatever. Three months later, that place closed. You see, that's why when Shimei in the story in the Old Testament was throwing the rocks at David and the man said, shall I go kill the guy and get rid of this guy throwing rocks at you? So David said, no, let the guy keep throwing the rocks. There might be something of God in it. You see, we need to have an openness to hear from sources that might be surprising. So I want to encourage you, maybe take some time in church. I'm not sure if there's anyone here tonight from anywhere other than St. Luke's or St. Stephen's, but maybe when we get back together after lockdown, maybe you could go to someone and just give them a word that strengthens them or give them a word of encouragement or a word of comfort as a part of using that gift of prophecy that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 14. You never know what God is going to do. And sometimes God can speak to us warnings by his spirit. When I was pastoring, one of the people in the congregation, I got a picture of someone falling down some stairs at a house. And I had never felt this like this before, but I felt strongly, you need to call that person's house now. And so I prayed and I prayed protection over the people in the house. And then I picked up the phone and called the lady that was the mum of the family on the phone. And she just told me someone had just fallen down the stairs and they were okay. To say that happens once in a blue moon is an understatement. So I'm not pretending to be anything hyper-spiritual by saying that. It's the grace of God. And I need to actually open my heart much more to hear God's voice for those kinds of things as a part of, of what we do. So, but I want to encourage us tonight to be filled with the joy and the blessing of the Spirit of God to covet the gift of prophecy and to be people that are available to God to hear the things out of the ordinary at the same time as being people that strengthen, encourage, and comfort. So let us close in prayer. Look, let's look to the Lord. And I'm going to pray this prayer over us tonight and uh, just look to the Lord and receive this. 
going to guard it in the way that you want to. Almighty God, how thankful we are for the seal of Holy Spirit in our lives. The deposit in my heart that testifies that I am truly yours. But today, Lord, I come asking for more. Fill me afresh with the presence and power of you, Holy Spirit. Let there be greater room for the work of Holy Spirit in our hearts. Oh God, may we be clothed with power from on high. Make us ready to receive all that you have for us. Forgive us, Lord, for the plans that we have made and the ways that we have walked in our own strength and have ignored Holy Spirit. In doing so, we have put the Spirit out, the Spirit's fire. Have mercy, Holy Spirit, and fill us again. In our homes, churches, communities, and place of work, lead us, Holy Spirit, into deeper waters. Pour out yourself on those around me. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you rain down on us that we might be changed and have first love passion for the three in one burning within us again. I ask that Holy Spirit be present in power among us from the youngest to the oldest. Oh God, fill us to overflowing with you, Holy Spirit. May we be led and guided by Holy Spirit ever deeper into truth that we might truly know Christ and make God known. Increase our hunger for your word and for holiness and the fullness of the expression of the spirit among us. May we learn to live by the spirit in our everyday living, being attentive to Holy Spirit's voice and obedient to your promptings. May we keep in step with you, Holy Spirit, putting aside our own agendas, watching closely for where you are at work and eagerly entering in. May the fruit of the Spirit increase in our lives, calling us to overflow with joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May it be evident to all that we belong to you. Through the continual filling of Holy Spirit, change us, O God, in, and in doing so, may our lives come alive and be revived. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.